Hi, everybody. We're so happy to see you here. Welcome. I'm Jen Guitart. I work for the California Bicycle Coalition. And um, I'm here with Forrest Barnes from SFMTA, with Julia Campbell from Alta Planning, Jason Henderson from SF State, and Laura McCamey, also of CalBike. And um, we we're doing something a little bit different for this session, as you might have noticed in the session description. We, we're gonna, this is really all about the conversation in the room. We are gonna kind of set up the topic, and then we're going to, and each person is going to kind of um, introduce their own spe specific interest in this sort of broad topic of climate change and culture change. And then we're going to break out into five groups, but one of the groups is going to be a Zoom group, which is going to be all, everybody who's joined by, who's joining on Zoom, which I don't know if there is anybody. And then there will be five gr groups in the room. And so what we're going to do is when we get to that point in the discussion, we're going to move our chairs into circles and we're going to have five little breakout sessions. And then we're going to come back together and we're going to share out what we talked about and hopefully come away from the session with some really exciting ideas to bring back to our communities and also some exciting opportunities for collaboration among us here in this room. So I'm going to leave. I'm going to give it to Forrest now, who's going to introduce a little bit further the topic of today and, and what we're kind of hoping to accomplish. Hello, I am Forrest Barnes. I am a transportation planner with the SOMTA. Um, currently, I work on some more new mobility regulation and planning, including um, scooters, Uber, Lyft, taxi planning, and then um, commuter shuttles, which is not really important in the context of this conversation because actually um, I'm putting on my former CalBike hat um, and advocate hat and um, today I actually want to encourage everyone to think big um, in this session. Um, as everyone knows, we are, you know, in a climate emergency. Um, there is, you know, we've already blown through our carbon budget, as everyone knows, but every degree matters. Um, and um, really in this session, want to encourage us to think about about ways that the Overton window, which is this idea of um, what is possible in the discourse, um, what are things that um, people are talking about. Um, and so I want to encourage all of us to put our hats on and think about how to stretch that window wide open um, in regard to climate action and biking and active transportation. What are the ways in which we can um, bring our communities and our governments together in order to really address this pressing issue? And in, in um, my personal opinion, probably the, the biggest issue addressing humanity overall. And um, it's very exciting at a bike summit because we're gonna really all bring all of the different intersectional issues that we've um, been discussing and really think about how they interact with climate and what we actually will be doing. And so um, in terms of the sessions uh, and the breakouts, I will um, actually be talking about things um, in terms of the, the dream bigger category. Um, so in, in my group, we'll be having discussions about things like, well, what if we actually just demanded that like the the city ran the bike share system and it was free and part of transit or you know even looking at things like the recent covid bill and the stimulus checks you know that was enough money basically to buy everyone in the united states an e-bike um, what would that look like if everyone um, and so i think really because of the emergency that we're in really thinking um in, in terms of how things change, I want to encourage us to to listen to the other speakers and think about the the infrastructure change, the government change that's needed, but also the culture change. Um, so we're going to have some discussion about open streets, quick build, um, and the history of how other cities like Copenhagen and the Netherlands actually became such bike friendly places. And we're going to do our best to learn from what they did and to think about how we can most quickly and effectively bring that back to our own communities. And so as Jen said, we're going to be planning. Um, it can be actions, art pieces, 
shows, etc. And Jen's session actually will be around art and culture and um, sort of the, the changing culture around biking. But um, I, I really just want to take a quick moment to, to think about how radically different um, our government acted in COVID, how many trillions of dollars it was able to spend just like that, how much money it was able to send out, um, unemployment, those things. And so really that level of emergency where Congress gets together within one month and passes trillions of dollars, like we really needed that decades ago for climate um, <laughs> mitigations. And so um, again, I really encourage us to think big and you know, if not at the federal level, cause it's really looking kind of bleak there at the moment, what can we also demand of the state, which we know is loaded right now and of our local um, governments and even our own community. What does um, radical mutual aid and respect to you know biking look like and how quickly can we um, encourage change? And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Julia who's gonna talk about how open streets and the culture around them are quickly changing um, and what we can learn from that. Thank you, Forrest. Yeah, so if, if that wasn't clear, what we're gonna do is we're each gonna introduce kind of a topic of focus and then we're gonna break out into groups and we're gonna have you know more focused discussions. So we're each kind of pitching you our own ideas of what we wanna talk about. And um, so the thing I wanna talk with you all about today is you know this is the first big conference I've been to since the pandemic that we're here in person and that's exciting. And that means that we're exiting out of the pandemic maybe, you know, fingers crossed. But what we've all been experiencing for the last couple of years has been a different way of life. And what we're talking about when we're talking about behavior change and travel change is we're talking about trying something new. Um, you know, the, the hill that we're trying to get everybody over is to, you know, try not driving every once in a while for a certain trip all the time, whatever it is. But usually if you're trying to get somebody to behave differently, the biggest challenge is just that first step. And we know that through all the behavior research, um, you know, at places like TRB, at other conferences and things like that, the best way to get somebody to try to do something new is to take them in a safe environment, take them by a hand, um, somebody who trusts them and they trust the other person, try that new experience together. That's the way that we get people to actually try riding a bike, try not taking the car, try something different. It's in this supportive environment. And um, open streets are really the gateway drug for riding a bike. Um, I live in Los Angeles. Um, I didn't do my intro, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and we have Ciclavias, which are you know, our, our way of interpreting what Bogota started many decades ago. Everybody knows this story of how transformative open streets can be. So even in the city of Los Angeles, which still to this day, very car centric, um, come on a Ciclavia day. It is a different city. I love LA on Ciclavia days. It's a completely different world. And you know, you think like nobody drives, I mean, nobody rides bikes uh, in LA, like come out, watch it. Watch hundreds of thousands of people take that bike out of their garage or whatever and ride it around the city all day for hours and hours. It is life changing. Um, so what I wanna talk with you all today is, you know, we've been experiencing a different world for the last two years. How many people had a city that you live in where maybe something different happened in the street? Was there a slow street? Was there an alfresco program? Was there sidewalk dining that spilled out into the parking lane? Yeah. Is that stuff made out of concrete yet? No. Is it made out of at least like pop-up materials maybe still, if it's still around, maybe? Yeah, so we have this moment right now as we exit out of the pandemic, where's all that stuff gonna go? Is it all gonna go back to being a parking lane? Is it all gonna go back to being a general purpose travel lane? Are we gonna lose that space for people? It doesn't have to. Um, and so that's, you know, my pitch to everybody in this room today is, you know, let's hear about what everybody's um, cities and communities have done during the pandemic. And there are tools to make it permanent. Um, in my previous role, I'm now with Ulta Planning um, and some of our team, like yesterday, if you heard Vincent Helens talking about um, some of the quick build stuff that we did in the city of Glendora, 
um, down in Southern California, they, they have made some of their solicitor stuff more permanent already, but they're a very small city, very motivated. They moved really quickly. It's beautiful. They've already made it into like a really nice environment that's gonna be around for some years. Most cities can't move that quickly. Um, and now we do have the pandemic executive orders um, have been lifted. And so now if cities do want to keep that temporary infrastructure around, some of it, which was actually barricades and things that are only made to be up for 72 hours. Some of them have been up for two years now. Um, equipment that's not meant to last more than a couple days has in sometimes lasted this long. In other cases, not. Um, but this is our chance. And we do have a law that I want to tell everybody about. Um, I had an opportunity to work on this in my previous role with the city of Los Angeles. It's called AB 773, and it allows each city in the state of California to create what's called a slow streets program in your city with an ordinance. And the city gets, gets to make its own rules for how to remove cars off the road. It's a tool that I wish everybody would take home, lobby your city council, make sure they know about it. And it's a tool that you you can use that makes it easier to make a slow street program more permanent and that you know that word slow streets can apply to any of the different variations that have happened um, it's called a b assembly bill 773 yeah. so that's my pitch is let's talk about that Awesome. Thank you, Julia and Forrest. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Jason Henderson, and I am a geography professor in the Department of Geography and Environment at San Francisco State University. Um, I uh, mainly, uh, my research mainly focuses on the politics of mobility, and I uh, get into the questions of political ideology and how political ideology shapes the built environment and shapes the transportation system. So for for example, um, you know, just as a, as a quick overview, um, you know, progressive politics has a, a more sort of, you know, the public, public realm, public regulation, public transportation, um, whereas a more neoliberal kind of ideological outlook might consider, you know, privatization deregulation, deregulation, you know, um, you know, shake out as much as you can from labor. Um, and the politically conservative, uh, ironically, uh, conservatives and progressives have one big thing in common in American politics of mobility, and that is that the government should intervene. Conservatives believe that the government should intervene to make sure that car driving is as easy and cheap and unfettered as possible. So, you know, we've, the, the most active government probably in the world in terms of shaping people's behavior is this kind of conservative thread in American politics. So um, I did a book on San Francisco called Street Fights in San Francisco. And uh, that that book looked at things like the freeway revolts. It looked at the uh, the, 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 the conflicts over parking and the, 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 the litigation against San Francisco's bicycle plan in the 2000s and, and more. Um, but my and, and, and I followed up with a, a street fight in Copenhagen uh, book where I, I went to Copenhagen because so many people were talking about Copenhagen, but it's, it stops at, you know, Copenhagen did a very good job of, 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 of sustaining cycling, but no one really explains why. No one gets into the politics. And what I found when I was in Copenhagen was that it's an extremely ideological, um, there's a diverse array of uh, opinions. It has to be defended. It's not a done deal. Um, it probably won't be taken away, but in, within Denmark, there are actually remarkably very similar debates over streets. Even even widening a bike lane in a neighborhood in Copenhagen, you, you have the merchants, you have um, you know a, tr a, a perspective from transit, you have um, all kinds of different uh, uh, perspectives. So it's actually quite politically charged. It's not like oh, this is just how it is. Um, so my, what what I'm interested in today Day, though, is what kind of precedence um, uh, uh, is this moment with the Ukraine and fossil fuels and this discussion, this post-pandemic um, uptick in, in driving? I mean, we have a crisis and, uh, um, you know, 
I, I look at historical crises like World War II. In the United States reduced driving by 35% during World War II through a uh, very aggressive rationing program. Um, the 1957 Suez Crisis, which was a, the closing of the Suez Canal, cut off the Netherlands uh, to oil, and that actually triggered uh, a revisiting of the bicycle in the Netherlands. And in the 1970s, uh, there were these uh, uh, two-pronged energy crises that really uh, became localized in Copenhagen politics. And by the end of the 70s, you had huge, massive demonstrations um, of, of cyclists in, in, in front of Copenhagen's city hall, sort of like critical mass. Um, in the Netherlands, there was a massive crisis of violence uh, vehicular violence and lots of children were being killed in the 70s and that led to a a, 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 a citizen-led response that resulted in uh, cycling infrastructure um, we heard about cuba this morning and when the soviets uh, uh, stopped sending oil to cuba in 1990 um, they got a million bikes from china and uh, instilled a, a cycling culture um, the um the pandemic um, especially the first year of the pandemic, uh, you know, really we saw the results of what happens when driving is cut 30, 40, 50 percent. Um, so what my question is, 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 you know, what are our what is this political inflection point? I think we need to take advantage of it. Um, and uh, make, you know, what is the opportunity out of the crisis? And uh, how can we uh, re redirect this to not decarbonization, but decar? Uh, because that's what we really need to do. Uh, so hopefully uh, some of you will offer some ideas that maybe we can think about uh, an opportunity this summer uh, to uh, respond to this crisis with the fossil fuels, climate, and the post-pandemic recovery. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And um, I just want to give a brief note on time. We have 10 minutes till we want to do breakout. So Laura and I are going to try to stick to four minutes, five minutes, so we have time to move chairs and stuff. Um, and I will be repeating what the different breakout rooms are at the end. I mean, breakout groups are at the end, so don't feel like you have to remember them all. <laughs> I'm Laura McKamey, um, and I do communications at CalBike, and I used to work for the Center for Biological Diversity in the climate change group, so this is a topic Topic that's really close to my heart. It's very important to me. Um, and the thing that I've been thinking about um, is quick build. And um, I'm sure you're all familiar with quick build as far as putting infrastructure on the street quickly. But I think quick build is an approach we can take to a lot of things. We quick build changed our lives in March 2020 in ways that we didn't think we could do. Um, and I, I think. And, and quick build and joy. And I, I just want to give an example. It's not from the biking world, but an example that it was in my life. Um, my wife and I got married in 1995, but we couldn't really get married. We got some kind of lame thing from the city of San Francisco. They didn't even have a ceremony for us at that time, a civil ceremony for gay people. And we really thought at that point that maybe when we were 90, we'd be legally married, but we were not very hopeful about it. And there was a lot that went into the marriage equality movement, but there was one moment that I think was really important. Um, and, and it was a moment that defied logic. And I know there's a lot of planners and engineers here, and I love all of you and your logic is really important, but, and I'm very, I like to be logical. It's important to leave that behind sometimes. So in 2004, Gavin Newsom, who was the mayor of San Francisco at the time, um, on Valentine's Day, decided to start marrying gay couples, queer couples. And, um, and it was illegal in California to do that then, but they were just like, come on down. And I, I told my partner, no, it's going to get shot down. I was very logical about it. And she, thank God, is not very logical. She was like, no, we have to do it. It'll be great. And it's something, it's, it's a day I'm going to remember for the rest of my life. It was amazing. There were people from Nevada, people that come from all over. And 4,000 couples got married in San Francisco before the court shot us down. Um, it was the result of that and the litigation that came out of that that allowed us to get legally married in 2008. But even more importantly, I think, it, and that was a quick bill 
called action. I mean, I'm sure there was, there was a lot that went into it, but it was like, boom, we're doing this. We're not asking permission. We're just effing doing it. And what it did is it, it made a big difference to all of us who were there, but it also made a bigger difference to the whole country because the whole country got to witness gay couples just wanting to be the same, wanting to be recognized, wanting people who had been together for decades, wanting to be legally recognized and, and the joy in that. And having witnessed that, I think that really made a big difference in shifting public opinion. That, that public opinion on um, same-sex marriage shifted much more quickly than it has on other social, social issues. And so I think, where can we get points, pivot points like that, where we can do something that shows people the joy? Um, and I think joy is really important to getting people out of their cars because that's why I bike. Even though I'm an anxious person, I had to take an anxiety class the first year that I started. I got rid of my car 15 years ago because riding on the streets was terrifying me. And my wife was like, you're, you're dangerous. You're to deal with this. Um, and, and today I rode here with not looking over my shoulder because the Overton window was moved by Bikey Spay's amazing work. I rode on Telegraph Avenue on a protected bike lane where I didn't think I was gonna be killed at every minute. Um, so how do we get more people to experience that joy? How do we show the world that joy? So everyone's like, yeah, I want that. Hey, city government, give me that joy on my street, even if it's not there right now. Like what, what big action can we take? What quick build kind of actions can we take to just like flip the picture? Because um, we. We don't have time to mess around. And I also think it's very powerful to bring people with you. I'm, I'm really of the mindset now that if, if I tell you, oh, you'll, you know, get out of your car, we're going to build this bike lane, it'll be good for the business, your business, it'll be good, you know, people don't believe you, but you do it while they kick and scream. And then they're like, oh yeah, the, the, the first year of open streets in San Francisco, the merchants in Embarcadero said, no way, or not Embarcadero, the Fisherman's Wharf, they were like, do not come here, we don't want you. The next year they begged open streets, please, please come here. I have never seen so many people in Fisherman's Wharf. So we just have to show people, not tell, show, quick build. Awesome, thank you, Laura. I, I have a mic, so. <laughs> um, so I, I work for CalBike. I'm the director of advancement, which is kind of uh, the fundraiser and list builder and communications person. And also, um, in addition to doing that, some many of you know that I write songs and make music videos. And so I'm, I want to lead a, a discussion about, um, and oh, and I wanted to add a little more to my history than, that, than just that. I, I have written a lot of songs about biking ever since I started working at CalBike seven years ago and a lot of and I started writing songs about climate some of them are incredibly nerdy I have an idea to write a song about that sort of breaks down the math behind why we cannot uh, expect electric vehicles to solve our transportation problems and climate you know and our, our climate if, uh, carbon emissions problems um, and uh, I and I also have a, a history uh, in my youth. I have I, my recent work with CalBike is very, you know. I, I think we all know that bike advocacy is. I mean, it's really important, but it also can feel really frustratingly slow at times. And um, it's like we're doing this kind of incremental work. And. We, ha we need really radical changes right now to have healthy, equitable, sustainable communities and to not completely ruin our climate. Um, and so but some of the, the kinds of activism that I used to do as a younger person were more like, you know, I was working on AIDS activism in the, in the 90s and um, we would do, you know, die-ins, we would like, you know, lie down at the, the school board to get comprehensive sex education. We'd have gravestones and we'd scream and shout and get the media there. and we do, you know, things like like we arrive at a prom. All this, I was a teenager at the time, so it wasn't like creepy. I would arrive at a prom, all dressed up in, um, you know, a prom outfit, even though it wasn't my prom, and maybe handing out condoms and safe sex literature and stuff like that. So, you know, sort of like these kind of creative, like let's let's do something that sort of draws attention to the issue, that gets people really excited about it, that kind of changes the way that people think. And you know, that's so that's kind of the topic that I want to talk about today. If you're interested in sort of 
of brainstorming ideas for sort of like creative, just ways to try and kind of change the, the conversation and get people thinking about, you know, what they can do differently and sort of like what, and, and sort of to, to wake up a little bit. I mean, I feel like, you know, all of you are, have your eyes very wide open, but it seems like the rest of, <laughs> the rest of America is kind of walking around like this when it comes to the climate crisis. So um, that's kind of, that's going to be my group. So I'm going to quickly, I want to have time for us to just get together in groups and talk. So what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly just give a three word or four word reminder of everybody's topics and then you can we're going to spread out laura's going to take the people on zoom and you have the you have the situation worked out there right so um i guess jason why don't you be over in that corner and julia you can be in this corner and forrest you can be in that corner and i'll be in this corner and what we're going to do is we're going to make a circle if you, you just come to the corner that you want to be in and we're going to just circle up the chairs and um yeah and so i'm 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 going to be talking about art and activism. Or maybe I should just pass it down and everybody can really quickly remind people in a couple of words. I'm going to be talking about art, creative expression, and sort of bold activism. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, just ideas that um, are going to be radical demands. So what can we demand that we don't currently have that's, you know, really on a... Uh, uh, like, like um, Jason had said, like a World War II level demand. Oh, wait, and can I just add? Sorry, I meant to say, I'm not, I'm going to be talking about what we're going to be talking about because it's not me, it's us. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, and so for my group, that'll be like things that, think, think things that like would be like in a Green New Deal type demand. And my group will be talking about, um, you know, taking advantage of the temporary changes to our streets during the pandemic and trying to figure out ways to make them more permanent. Um, how to leverage opportunity out of this current fuel crisis, I guess, would be the, the main thing The um, uh, based on the precedence of, of previous uh, events, similar events. And I'll be talking about Crickville, but since the Zoom group doesn't have a choice, whatever, if any of these topics um, move you, we'll definitely talk about them, and I'll just bring you back to Crickville. And then um, we have a little worksheet, and so we hope somebody in the group will volunteer to write stuff down on the worksheet, or it can be also the facilitator. And so let's do it. Let's break out. And um, I think I'm... Oh, oh, yeah, sorry. I forgot. We were going to take questions first if people wanted clarification about what we're doing now or about the topics or that kind of thing. Hi. Don't mean to point anything out exactly, but I'm just like just going to share that it just feels like maybe a, a section for like racial equity since uh, folks in brown and black neighborhoods get affected the most by this kinds of changes it would be a good conversation as well. And um, just kind of pointing out something that at least I'm kind of feeling at the moment. So. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I would like to encourage us all to incorporate that. I mean, I plan on talking about that for sure in our group, and I want that to be part of the conversation. So if people want to talk about that, I also am not sure how many people here want to talk about art and activism. So we can we can <laughs> take that as part of our conversation topic as well, kind of if that's your main concern and you feel like the other group, the other areas don't speak to that, come to me. Um, other questions or concerns or thoughts or, or just, I mean, I love that you suggested an additional topic that we can add and I'm psyched about that. If other people have just an angle you want to say, like, I want to be in that group, but I want to add this thing. Yes. Um, well, this was in the description, so I guess you all had already come up with it, but like the tactical urbanism kind of things like like Crosswalk LA stuff things, where would that, where should people go for that discussion? Who wants to take that? I kind of feel like Jason or Forrest, depending on, I don't know, if that would sort of fit into those. Okay. Yeah, we could have more groups, but I, I just worry because we don't have like, well, it looks like we have about, we could have another group. We could add, I mean, we could add like, we could, maybe we could have six groups and we add those two ideas as additional groups. Let's take a vote. What do people think? Should we raise your hand if you think we should have six groups? And raise your hand if you think that we should just add those topics to the, the four existing groups. 
Okay, it looks like people are kind of in that. Okay, cool. So we'll do that and and uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about art activism and racial equity and inclusion. Um, I'm going to be talking about radical demands, and I also feel like tactical urbanism can fit into that if you want as well. And I'm talking about the, you know, capitalizing on the changes in the pandemic, which was a form of, you know, city sponsored tactical urbanism, but like it was flexible. People did what they wanted, so it could include that. Um, <laughs> And I'll be talking about how we should be responding at, as in, you know, the cycling community with broader green mobility to the fossil fuel crisis that's unfolding uh, this summer in front of us. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I'll be doing quick build plus all of the above topics. And I love the ideas of adding tactical urbanism to that and, uh, and racial and social equity. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Oh, sorry. There you go. The chance, even if there's just one person. Well, they can hear us now. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be bringing you all up to panelists so that you can speak with Laura. So you'll see this thing on your screen that says allow to be panelists. You can accept that. <laughs> to be here with you. I'm going to turn up the volume a little bit loud in here. I know. I was. I, th I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you guys now. That's why I've got my headset on, so I can hear you and not everything else that's going on in here. And I'm going to take, I'll, I'll be the note taker, so I've got the doc here ready to take notes. Um, so we're just brainstorming. Whatever, whatever you guys want to throw out, you all um, I'll just start. I because uh, I was really just listening to what all of the sort of made big topics were, um, and I I kind of did like the idea of um, Jason's idea of I, I kind of heard him thinking of an action that we could all be taking this summer, and uh, some sort of climate action or other um, group effort like all of the bike coalitions doing something together. Um, around climate action and fossil fuels and the climate crisis. I like that idea. Um, I love to think about quick build things as we can do as part of that. Um, just so you know, I, I'm the president of the uh, Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition up here in Sonoma County. And uh, Eris Weaver is there. You might have met her. She's our executive director. I probably emailed with you guys because I sent out emails to various Oh, yeah. partners. So we probably met over email in the past. Excellent. Um, so yeah, I, th those are the two, the two quick things I'll just start with. What was, I got one, so I, I'm sorry, what's the second thing? I got climate action this summer, all the bike coalitions coordinating to uh, do an action. What uh, was the second? Uh, the, the other thing is just, a, you know, more quick build projects. We, I would love to see 
some quick build separated bike lanes, a, a, a low stress network that just gets put up in the city, you know, overnight would be nice. Um, but some sort of quick build, um, low stress protected bike way that everybody can very quickly experience what we're talking about. Um, a Ciclovia event, I would love that. That's going to take a year to plan. We actually have one coming up in probably in June that it'll you know be a smaller one in Petaluma. But but I think um, if we can um, demonstrate, that's just a one day event. If we can demonstrate with the quick build some protected bikeways and have everybody get it and 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 have just some key corridors identified and and a quick build um, protected bikeway put up quickly. Sounds radical and achievable. <laughs> I love it. And Audrey, um, did you want to do you want to throw out some brainstorm ideas? Um, I'm open to any conversation, really. Um, I'm and just to introduce myself, I work for Caltrans here at, in the Sacramento headquarters office. Um, oh, awesome! I think I kind of want to more so participate in the conversations that everyone else wants to have and see how that can impact my work. So, yeah, I like awesome. both of those ideas. Well, and and let me ask you a question because I have to say that I really am taken. I just am having a visual of you wake up one morning and there's a quick build bikeway network that takes you safely all the way to work. And maybe it's only up for two weeks. It's a demonstration project. Like, is that something that's legal under current California regulations? If a city wanted to do that, could they do that? I don't, if it, personally, I don't know if that is something, I think it kind of depends on the community and the context really. Um, so there's, it's not a state law. I don't think so. Yeah, that sounds. Yeah, I think it would just really depend on the community more so, more so like the city. That makes sense. That makes sense. Love that. And, you know, I keep thinking about um, this sort of relates more to what Jen is talking about. There used to be just bringing humor into it, bringing fun into it. Like at the movie night, there was one of the movies that really stuck with me. Um, at, were either of you at the movie night before I? Okay, so at the movie night, there was one short that was on Valencia Street in San Francisco. Valencia Street has bike lanes, but at least at the, I don't know if they're protected now. I haven't, I haven't been to San Francisco in so long because um, of the pandemic, but they have um, bike lanes and people are parking in them constantly. Um, and so these people went out with signs that said just a minute and they were like they went and blocked tra the traffic lane so that when somebody parked in the bike lane so the bikes could come in a traffic lane and the cars had to wait and they just said just a minute they'll just be so there'll just be a minute just a minute and they held up these signs and i thought that was great because it took something really annoying and angering and they treated it with humor um and and i keep thinking like how can we because i think I think it's easy to be, for me at least, as a bicycle advocate, to be a little bit, I'm angry, shrill, because you just almost ran me over or whatever, you know, like my adrenaline's up, I, my life is threatened. Like, how can I step back from that and do something that allows people to come in because it's more welcoming, it's funny, it may be challenging them in some way, challenging their underlying assumptions, but with humor as opposed to like, you're killing the planet with your car you know, or something, you know, like that's not a message that's going to make anyone get that in their car. Um, like, I, I don't know, I just, um, humor seems like a really important element, humor and fun. Um, yes. I think what you said, I believe you said it, um, something that shows people joy. And I do think that's really important. And um, the, the bike, our, our bike coalition just put out our t-shirt with bicycle and the, the word joy was the largest word that you can see on the mm. on the bike and so one of the things that I've heard from these two days are just 
the amazing things that these bike, uh, the bike parties are doing, <laughs> the East mm -hmm. Bay Bike Party, but also just very fun bike rides that bring out people and that allows them to feel safe and have fun. And we have a ride that's growing like that. It's called our Taco Tuesday ride and it's open to anybody. And people are now like decorating their bikes with lights. So when we're out at night, it's all this, and they have all, everybody brings boom boxes and, and uh, they go and get tacos together and um, stop at, a, at the brewery on the way. So that, to me is a really good way to get people on a bike having fun that just as they said that kind of first experience that first step is getting out there on a bike having fun so i think you know building a more successful bike this this bike experience and maybe i'm just th thinking you know really get the city behind it to promote it to do more for it because the organizers are already there doing such a fabulous job. You know, they have 30 or 40 people, um, maybe 60 on a good day, but it could easily be a hundred or a thousand if um, there was a lot of energy put into promoting it. Yeah, and it just made me think one of the things that, I, and I, I, I forgot to mention this, but I was thinking bike party is a great example of bringing the joy and scraper bikes too. It's like that artistic decorative, like this isn't just a bike. This is an expression of who I am. It's expression of my spirit of fun. Yes. And like, who wouldn't want to join bike party? Like when it first, I don't know if it was how new it was when I was on it a few years ago, a number of years ago now, but it was what, one of the things that blew me away is that we'd ride through these residential neighborhoods and there's loud music and everyone's ringing their bells and yelling bike party. Yeah. And people would come out of their houses and stand for the entire exactly. time yes. and just happy, not mad, like thrilled. Like people came out of restaurants, like people just poured out and it went by my house a, a few months ago. And we just came and hollered in the street the whole time until the yeah. last person went by because it was so exciting. Right. Um, it's, it's like, a, yeah. So, and, and bike party, I know I've seen people be like, oh, bike party's here. I'm getting my bike out. I'm joining, you know, right. I'm going to go exactly. around. But, but I think, and I think that's the kind of thing that teaches people that bike riding is fun. But I could see, like, I've ridden places with bike party, like on San Pablo Avenue in the East Bay, which is a big, um, you know, Caltrans through street and I wouldn't do it without them. Right. So, so how do we bridge that gap? Like if I had a car, I might go out with bike party and have a great time, but that doesn't translate to like, how do you translate that culture to no? that's how I want to get to work tomorrow. That's how I want to pick up my kids. I, you know, what? I, well, I, I just, I, it, if we can turn them into advocates, um, so we, we show them that this is a very, very fun event. And then if we could say, hey, we need your help to advocate. So it's a big leap, you know, most people don't want to advocate, you know, <laughs> it's a lot of work, it's hard. It, is. it takes a certain kind of um, personality to be an advocate. And, and so that has to come organically, but hopefully it, it can be made easy to advocate. I think, I th you know, I think that is a key that I don't think it's realistic to expect the world to become advocates, but if we can provide easy ways for them to action that sort of accomplishes the same thing, then we can build more voice for the protected network, protected bikeways, the things that we need that they can see easily that, that we need. Making it, yeah. One thought I have is, is a holothon because one of the, the big objections people have is, well, I can't get my groceries on my bike. I can't get, you know, blah, right. blah, blah. I've been grocery shopping on my bike for a long time and it would be kind of fun to have an event where people brought their cargo bikes, their bike trailers, you know, whatever, just their regular panniers and maybe put weird random stuff in it. Not groceries, but like tubas or, you know, big lightweight sculptures that stuck up, like just something that's like shows that you, you can do it on a bike. Um, um, just weighing in on that one. I think that one is, is kind of hard because you also have to, I guess, prepare people to be able to have a cargo bike. Um, those are super expensive and not super accessible. So I think it would have to start smaller than that with, you know, those simple trips, like you said, like to work, like trying it once a week 
where there are like programs in place with those employers, for example, with Caltrans, um, we have an incentive if we actually work in person, we work virtually at this point, but when we did work in person, if you biked to work at least half of the days of your month of work, you would get um, a certain stipend back and you would just fill out this form pretty much once a month and you would get a little paycheck for money, right? Like for riding your bike. And that's only half the time. You don't even have to do it full time. I think that that is like the key right there, but then it can move on later once they have those simple trips, the everyday trip back and forth to this place that they go to that may be pretty close um, where it's as simple as just getting to and from. And then once you do the shopping type of trips, that one's a little bit more challenging just because, yeah, like they do have to carry some stuff. Maybe they have a big family. They can't have five packs of groceries on their bike. So I think you have to start smaller than that. Um, yeah. So I, I, yeah. I wonder if we could even have people with standard bikes, not cargo bikes. I agree that is the higher lift. And even a car, I used to use a trailer with a standard bike, but you know, that costs money too. Um, but even just panniers on your bike, like you can put a lot on a standard bike. I used to do my grocery shopping on my standard bike with panniers and baskets and stuff. And just to put, if we got styrofoam sculptures or something, you know, just something kind of attention grabbing and outrageous to say, right. I can do it by bike. Sort of you can, you know, to raise awareness of everything that you can put on a bike. But with a sense of humor, like with some, you know, goofiness, um, just a thought. I, I kind of want to go on that ride. Um, but I love that. So I wrote down state programs to incentivize employers to, buy, to provide programs like the one Caltrans has. Right. And I don't know if we are, if there's already something in California like that, but just if the state said, if X number of your employees bike, you get this money and you pass it on to your, you know, the state will give the right. employer money to pass on to the employees or, you know, whatever. Um, and there, there could even be like credits or something too, because we're also assuming everyone has a bike. Um, I, it, depending on what city you live in, if it's an urban area, there's probably, you know, the jump bikes, the lift bikes, all of those. Right. Bikes. If there was maybe some type of employer program where on like certain days of the week, they get a certain credit to try a jump bike for free to get to and from work for the day. Um, that could be a really good start. And I think th those types of trips where they can just, you know, they, they don't need to have a bike right now. They can use a jump bike. They can get to and from because the stations that are, you know, where they get charged and stuff are probably near where they work in, in theory, right? Mm -hmm. So something like that would be a really good start to start really small. Well, I think that's a great idea. I love that idea. And I also, I want to bring us back to, um, big like bigger ideas because we started really big and then we've gotten very practical and I think that part of the point of this is to be impractical okay <laughs> so, sure um which not these are all awesome ideas I'm not no no um criticism of any of the ideas but I guess the question is because I'm thinking of all the ideas to get people on a bike which is awesome but people when I talk to people about it they, and, and I have done a lot of this, you know, with the kids and my neighbors, like going on bike rides together to get ice cream, just to get people more into it. But um, if I, when I talk to people, sometimes they're like, yeah, that would be nice, but I'm not doing that. People drive crazy, you know? And, yeah. and so without those safe facilities, it's really hard. You know, I was just even riding here today, even though I had bike lanes, protected bike lanes, like pretty good facilities that, and quiet neighborhood streets the whole way. I still had a couple of times when a car, I, I'm right next to a car, it's starting to pull out, it doesn't see me, stuff like that, that I got me going. And if I were less committed, that might be it. I might just be like, no, I'm going to die. The first few years I was riding more, I just was, I was thinking of all the ways I could die all the time. It was unnerving, you know? And so how do we, how do we do something that connects it? Like this really isn't a choice because we have the climate crisis and it's gonna be fun, it's gonna be okay. Like how do we do something dramatic that shows people, you know, this is it. Like, is it a demonstration where we get a few hundred people on bikes and they're just like, nobody's driving on X street or X, you know, do we, um, like what, what do we do that sort of says no business as usual, like this has got to change and it's going to be positive fun, you know, 
Do we do a renegade quick build without any permission? People do that around yeah. here sometimes. They put in bike lanes and stuff. I'm thinking like if if there is existing infrastructure in place, like a, a class two bike lane, if you could do pop-up class four bike lanes with you know very simple plastic barriers um, and potentially maybe closing lane on a certain way um, just to show them like this is what it could be if people were more interested in biking like and you advocated for this in your community um because i think a lot of the times there's there's room for things like that a class four bike lane let's say we have a class two buffered bike lane it's as simple as putting up a vertical barrier to make it a class four so if there were more advocates in the community even if they don't actually bike right now if they advocated for it um vocally then maybe they could get that type of infrastructure and then they would start using it. Cause that, those types of facilities are what we're gonna see um, like everyday average people using, not a two bike lanes on a road. Or right. You know? Yeah, totally. I, we did a, in, in my town, we did a, a ride to assess different bike infrastructure. And there's a street I ride on all the time without thinking about it, but other people were like, no, the cars were too close and they were going too fast. So that street right. is actually getting a separated two-way um, bikeway, um, protected bikeway right. in the future, which is very nice. Um, and partly because of that kind of feedback. Um, yeah, I love that, love that idea now, of pop-up. The AB 773 that um, Julia was talking about, I, I had not heard of that, but it does sound like at least it allows cities to, it says create a slow streets program with an ordinance and you can make your own rules to how to move cars off the road. I was curious if what, just learning more about that because maybe we can, you know, definitely bring that to our city and ask, you know, to say, this would allow you to, to put up barriers on a class two to turn it into a class four. I, I don't know what it allows actually. So I'm just wondering. Yeah, I think AB7, my understanding, and I may be wrong, is that AB773 is more related to the slow streets that a lot of cities did where they restricted traffic on certain neighborhood streets and that that could become permanent. It doesn't have to be temporary that you could sort of like Berkeley already has that because they have a bunch of streets where they've got, um, they divert traffic, it's local traffic yes. only. Yeah. With, um, they've had it for decades. And so right. I think AB773 would allow more cities to more easily do something like that where they you know in, in Emeryville they did a temp where I live they did a temporary slow street and then they turned it with quick build and the grant they turned it permanent where they closed a couple blocks and they turned a couple blocks into one way um so projects like that I think 8773 would okay just so, yeah and you know so any kind of long-term quick bells yeah all right because i you know i'm trying to think like back to the question of what radical thing could we just ask for right now and um you know i think it would be for the city to to say you know we're going to take cars off of you know the street this week and just have bikes just to, to put it out there and um it's not an So, and, so instead of and, a Ciclavia, have a Ciclavica. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And all they would have, they wouldn't have to, um, you know, they wouldn't have to, um, you know, hopefully they wouldn't have to police it and do all the things that they do, but just say, this is now going to be for bikes. And the thing is, merchants tend to scream about that kind of thing because they're like, my customers can't get to me. But if you say it's for a week, they get to experience how many people are going to come to them by bike and on foot. And so right. they have that lived experience of like, oh, maybe it's not Armageddon if the two cars that could park outside can't do that anymore. And instead I have 20 people on bikes come in, you know, to shop at my store. Um, I feel like I want a sign that says I bike and I shop. Like, really, I want to go to your store, but I can't get there because you're I'm not on a good street for me. Um, I love that idea. Yeah. Um, so, and, and what about connecting some of these actions to climate change? Like, like, I think that's part of the idea behind this is like, the discussion has been all around electric cars and, you know, this and that sort of like taking what we have now and just electrifying it, everything will be okay and climate. Um, and like, 
I, we want to put bikes into the discussion because we can't all drive electric cars, you know? Um, I just want to mention uh, there's people in the chat that are asking to be made panelists. Oh, okay. Let me, let me allow to talk. Okay. Mary, can you talk now? Yay. I'm sorry about that. And let's okay, and I. I, Anthony, that's my, I'm, okay, I did not realize, I'm so sorry, you guys, this is my um, Zoom ignorance, so um, thank you for pointing that out, Audrey. You know, it shouldn't be radical. Audrey, you're with Caltrans D5, right? I was, and I'm with headquarters now. Okay, so I'm, I'm in D5. Yeah. Um, and you know, it shouldn't be radical, but I think one of the biggest obstacles I see locally in Monterey County for people doing more commuting is, you know, those of us who are passionate advocates are going to push, push and push on a particular infrastructure need. Something as small as a pothole, I'm not a pothole, I'm not talking about a, a new, uh, you know, fast four lane, I'm talking about simple things that should not be that hard to get fixed. It takes a huge amount of time and energy and persistence often to get action taken. That's not reasonable. So I, I don't know that some people consider it radical, but um, I, I have many local people who say to me they gave up bike commuting because they keep trying to get potholes fixed. They never get an answer back. And if someone like myself who is willing to put you know tons of hours of time into this as a volunteer um, gets frustrated on fixing some of these issues. How are we ex going to expect to build up more advocates and build up more people commuting when when our our agencies, our public agencies, and our municipalities are so unresponsive? And I've been at for, as a volunteer for fourteen years. Well, I'll tell you that in Oakland, because there's very much the same problem in Oakland, there are potholes you could like fall into and never get out of here. And there was somebody going around for a while. There was, a, I think it wasn't just one person and they had cement or asphalt or something and they were fixing potholes. They were like, tell us about a pothole, we'll go fill it because the city wasn't doing it. So that's a possible renegade action is just to go fill the effing pothole. <laughs> um, well, and, no, seriously, I've thought of things like that, but I, I don't know that I'm willing to take the legal risk of doing some of these things. So. Well, and I think, I guess that's the question, like, and I think that's part of the reason that cities are averse to some of these things, like, oh, what if we do this and there's an accident or whatever? Anyway, I, Taylor, I've talked too much. Taylor, go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, I could give another example and I'd love some feedback from other areas of how they're resolving. Okay, go ahead, Mary. And then I know Taylor wanted to say something. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go no, ahead. Okay, please. go ahead. I'll mute. You go ahead, Taylor. Taylor, I don't know. It looks like you're unmuted, but I can't hear you. Do I, you know, I wonder if I need to... I, you know what, I, maybe I need to make you a panelist. Hang on, let me see. I'm going to promote everybody to panelist. I think that might be what I need to do. Okay, now try it again. Let's see. So Taylor, did you want to chime in? Did anyone else want to oh, hear um, you? Ah, uh, yes, now I can hear you. Yay. Uh, apologies. I have way too many input and output devices hooked up. Uh. To this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to chime in because I'm actually from New Orleans, a city famous ah. for its potholes. Uh -huh. And we, now I was not personally involved in this, but there was actually, and I'm trying to recall the details, but there was a private, and I'm not one of these people who jumps in and tries to offer a privatized solution to everything. But uh, in the case of New Orleans, um, there was a private company operating a short, very quick turnaround, localized pothole repair with a piece of heavy equipment that actually they could drive it out. And obviously this isn't ad hoc. This is a bit more of an operation. 
but they could drive it out. It was about the size of like a, a DPW dump truck and deposit directly off of the back of the truck through Burkhoff really some sort of funnel, uh, some, uh, some asphalt or asphalt-like material, and then pack it into the pothole. Uh, New Orleans had to basically rebuild every single street that was underwater in Katrina because water is heavy. Mm. And while a lot of that money came from the federal government, it also took a while. So there were some of these kind of ad hoc uh, and temporary operations on top of, of course, our tendency to decorate and throw a party around just about anything. Uh, so there's some really epic photographs floating around the internet of what people did to some of these really large potholes. Um, but yeah, no, it's, um, the potholes drive me nuts because I, I do have a, a conventional utility bike with relatively narrow 700 C tires. And it, they, it really is an obstacle, especially with how rare actual utility bikes are. Because like I have a heavy sprung saddle. So it's even as uncomfortable as it is for me. Um, I actually had for a brief period of time this year, a unsprung saddle on this bike. Cause I had swapped the sprung one onto my new e-bike because the one that came on it was horrible. And, you know, so many bikes that people are picking up at stores uh, have these very uncomfortable saddles that are very sporty and it just exacerbates the problem of uh, comfort and just being put off of riding a bicycle when rough pavement, and I'm, I'm in Chico, California right now, which has a lot of problems with road maintenance. And so I absolutely agree that, you know, at least arriving at some semblance of a minimum, a minimum acceptable level of repair is a critical part of uh, any sort of movement to get more people on bikes because Chico is incredibly bike friendly in terms of just the size of the city. But you know they they were very famous for a long time for building infrastructure early in like the Davis era, uh, but then they just kind of stopped. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they're still kind of building outdated infrastructure when they put new stuff in and the old stuff has been allowed to deteriorate and yeah that comfort uh, comfort can't be the role that comfort plays in people's willingness to ride it can't be underestimated that's great thank you and there's one more person i'm sorry i can't see oh anthony did you want to chime in because we haven't heard from you um, Any big ideas? Well, let's see. I was, I was. Uh, there was uh, kind of one thing I saw floating around on uh, Facebook there about using uh, uh, hair dryers for like uh, radar guns and stuff. Uh, I thought that was kind of a cute idea. I don't know if anybody else saw that. Uh, but we, yes. we yeah, we. Uh, uh, I would love to do that one. We've had issues with uh, uh, you know kind of speeding on certain corridors and things. So. Uh, that that way you could kind of get away with without getting dinged for putting something down. We we have yeah. had uh, some success with some of our city council uh, members have been supportive of doing crosswalk, uh, you know, uh, decorating contests and things like that. So that's been one way to kind of get some high visibility crosswalk uh, stuff uh, down too. So if you can get your uh, city council person on board, uh, you know, to help with that. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, that that's. Uh, that, that's been been uh, productive. You know, that I, that gives me an idea that, uh, you know, it would be something not permanent and you could use chalk to just cover a whole block with a mural, which is, I think, a good traffic calming and also, you know, could could be a, a vehicle for political expression, like in the Black Lives Matter movement, when people started painting that on the streets, um, that, you know, that was a, a, a really great way to spread the message. Yeah. The one one other thing we did was like yard signs, like slow down yard signs. We got the you can buy them on Amazon. So we try to get mm. as many neighbors as possible to you know kind of put them out on the on the street. So I, I don't know if uh, you know people see them or not. But <laughs> well, I, I was in um, uh, Cookville's seminar yesterday, and one of the things that um, Mr. Barricade said is signs don't work. Yeah. He was talking about street signs, but I think people 
don't see them. After all, he said, you need physical infrastructure to slow down cars. You need, you know, speed tables and speed humps and stuff like that. Um, Good point. Uh, that that was his thought. So so we're just to refocus us back on the the idea. And I see Taylor and I think. Um, Mary, just to refocus us back, we're talking about climate crisis, like what big um, actions can we take quickly to help, like we need to shift our transportation modes really fast. What, like what kind of ideas do you have for, for actions that we could take to do? So Taylor, go ahead. Well, uh, I mean, building off of you know, just to, what we were generally talking about, it, making it easy, but also, you know, there's a major problem with perception uh, with a lot of people, like was being discussed before. Um, I remember uh, some, a friend of mine, I think in Kansas City, uh, has started doing something interesting. Now, I, I'm no longer on Facebook, so I've been debating whether or not to dive back into that. Um, However, she's gone on her neighborhood Facebook group and basically made herself available for, for lack of a better phrase, commuter tutoring. tutoring. Uh, and, you know, because people really, I guess it's sort of like that, you know, the 60th percentile interested but concerned. People are interested, but they also have a question. And, I've done a lot of exploring personally into the types of bikes that are out there that you wouldn't ever find in a, in a shop in the United States. And people don't even realize sometimes that things like pan mirrors exist. Like they genuinely don't know that that's a thing. So Taylor, I'm sorry to cut you off, but that, that was great, I've got it. We're being called back together and I see Marie and Audrey both have their hands up. Do you wanna quickly jump in and just like, get your ideas out? Ready with, if it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. I feel again that it should not be considered a radical act, but I do feel this issue of. Sorry, hang on one second. Okay, go ahead. Oh, you know what? I can't hear you, and it might be that the sound is coming from the microphone. If you guys can put comments in the chat, I'll, I'll take them. Okay. Um, Shall I go ahead? Yeah, go ahead. So again, I don't think it should have to be a radical act, but it, apparently it is. I, I feel uh, this is a, an urgent thing that will make a big difference and have a big impact. If we can find a way for Caltrans and local cities and so on to do a much better job with responding to residents' concerns about specific infrastructure issues, as he was mentioning tutoring. I do that too in, in Monterey County. I get together with people who are wanting to talk to you, want me to go with them on the route, and they point out to me I'm from home. A lot of these things are easy fixes if they can just be, you know, if we can get these agencies to respond. So, Audrey, maybe you can give a look at the example I put in the chat with, with uh, Cal M on Highway Money. That woman has biked there. She's lived there, I think, 50 years now, biked that route for that long. And when they did the restriping and repaving, she's had to press on that since. Why do you want to protect their streets? Money. That's unreasonable. Thank you. Thanks. So, Audrey, did you want to put something in the chat? Also, kind of using existing tools, um, like our commercials, like how people in system would connect with it. Um, Turning that on its head to be sort of the bike community instead. Um, and then the last thing we kind of talk about is like, like going to like public forums and like taking up the street and using demonstration. You know, if, if things are big and like people can see, then it's kind of like an easy conversation and starter and break some barriers. And then over there. Uh, and then that's kind of the opportunity to like talk to more about it. And we have a lot of fun here too. Can we go to you guys now?
ended up being our facilitator. So I'll just kind of repeat back some of the things we talked about. So we, we kind of went around our circle and we shared like what were all the different installations of uh, of sidewalk dining, the outdoor dining and social that happened in various cities all across the state. We had a pretty good um, sample, I think. And I think to the city, what we discovered as we talked to each other is that there was a real difference in the longevity of something like a neighborhood traffic calming program, like slow streets during the pandemic, and the dining and the parking that showed up on retail And we kind of talked about um, there was a built in efficiency, there was built in support, there was you know, financial gain to be had by just the city saying, okay, businesses, you get more space, you're making more money. Um, and that allowed these all fresco dining programs to just kind of have a longer life and have built in support and uh, have pressure on the city to make them more permanent. Whereas there were you know, much more mixed results with neighborhood traffic. So it really took uh, only specific neighborhoods that had the resources, had the organization, active support and lobbying of the city in order to keep them in neighborhoods. And sometimes the structure of the program actually worked against slow streets staying in communities because um, they were volunteer based or required to go out there and take care of them. And that wasn't necessarily possible in the neighborhood under. Um, so those are some of the things we all talked about together. Uh, and then we talked about like, well, what do we want to do going forward? Um, you know, really what we're talking about is just, I, I like the word that Ryan used about like a modal filter for neighborhood streets. Like really that's what slow streets was, was discouraging cars to get more difficult so that you can walk and bike and feel safer. Um, and most communities are okay with that idea. And maybe they're okay with it on a temporal basis. Like maybe on a weekend, maybe at night, have a something to learn about it. Um, but maybe that's just going to have to slow things be more like open space. And we all know that that's not what that's going to be. And we also talked about where, where to go. How do we overcome uh, some of these aspects of racial inequality and resources and the ability to successfully lobby the government? Uh, I don't know if we have answers to that, but we do recognize that the single experiment that we ran during COVID um, had different outcomes based on Is there all the things we did. No, I'm not ready. Sorry. Well, for our group, um, it was really good to see the government here, but the people brought up great ideas of all of our party. Uh, the discourse, so I'll name some of the ones that we had as alternatives to one that we ended up thinking as like a really good um, campaigner stand, but uh, things like free public transit, ha like having uh, government control of, of the profits um, to pay back communities for uh, oil infrastructure, a carbon dividend tax of like uh, uh, all carbon is taxed and it's given back to the people. Um, as sort of like a stimulus payment to make up for that. Um, and it ended up helping low income more. There's also uh, ideas of like a 15 minute city, even on a local level, where like bus stops stop at one, let's stop like two lanes off the Bay Bridge, one for bike, one for transit. But we ended up deciding that um, actually we got a, a, a really powerful um, step and something that could be a winning. Coalition is a, a car expansion moratorium. Um, so basically, there's like two versions. One is just like a light version, which is state law, no new government funds will go towards expanding road authorities for automobiles. And then um, basically, the coalition for that is all of the money that's set aside for that is then freed up among communities to decide like, how they want to spend their money locally, housing. Um, you know, other groups, and at this point, it's made that there's always going to be money coming in, and so like, if it just doesn't go to cars, therefore, we're going to go to everything else we care about. Um, and then, like, the sort of more intense version is something that we thought um, we didn't know if it would be at a state or a local level, but just like it is like 
just simply we will not permit any new gas stations. We will not permit any new like oil change places. You know, and even so far as like potentially you could expand that to like parking lots and car dealerships. Um, just we really came to the conclusion that we should stop doing the bad things first. You know, like we uh, and, and we think that it's definitely a potential winning tool. It's just because of all the money that goes towards automobiles. If you could split that among a lot of different, you know, communities. Uh, I think that that's a good issue. So, okay, so I'll do real quick. We came up with a um, kind of summer campaign of glorify bicycles. Um, so, group rides, just you know, hyper, hyper visibility. Um, consistency, sustain um, uh, school bus, the bike, biking school buses, uh, uh, other kinds of kind of just you know visibility, uh, incorporating art and music to glorify uh, bicycling, bike to work weeks instead of bike to work days, um, and uh, close off streets uh, on those days with cars and, and, and really encourage. The idea that, that the more people see bikes in a positive, joyous, but also usually utilitarian, comfortable way, the more it will get to other people to bike periods, maybe they're still just apprehensive. And then uh, the other side of that coin was to de glorify the car and to, to use this moment where everyone, uh, everyone's attention is on you know, these fuel prices and, 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 and the, the, the kind of albatross that. Um, uh, the car that the current car system can be. Um, and so, de glorifying the car, we got some ideas like uh, uh, having bicycles swarm car shows, like the Detroit car <laughs> show or the LA car show. Uh, the, um, and also a, a concerted campaign to actually uh, shame Hollywood for glorifying the car, for example, Fast and Furious and other uh, movies mm -hmm. where gas puzzling vehicles are um you know associated with, with, with sex and machoism um, and all that kind of stuff so um some sort of a creative uh, anti-car machismo kind of campaign and then we also got on the car tax and with a social justice angle where there was some sort of a rebate and then you know, taking this opportunity to point out that fossil fuel prices are, are going to just continue to go up um, and, um, and and that, uh, you know, uh, talk about at the, at the very end, uh, having, having you know, large employers be more responsible for their workers' views um, instead of just kind of throwing, you know, throwing it out to them. And we did talk about displacement and the problem of a lot of folks being displaced and unable to just quickly, you know, switch to a bike because they, they work really far from where they live. So, so we have to have some sort of equity social justice side of this as well. So if you do do a carbon tax, it would have to be with a social justice aspect where, where it, you know, maybe it's a progressive carbon tax or, or you know, a tax on the carbon companies and then the rebate check or something like that. Cool. Thanks, Jason. Let me give this one Hey, thank you. Um, so the Zoom group came up with a whole bunch of ideas. Um, one thought was to do a climate action of some kind this summer that would involve all the bike co coalitions all across California, coordinating and doing an action together at the, at the same time in their local communities. Another thought was to do take a, build a low stress network, a complete connected low stress network as a pop up temporary have it up for a week or two so people could get to have that experience without putting in the infrastructure yet but they could get that to, to feel it um, to like identify key corridors and do this that would take obviously coordination with the local government um, another thought was um, something i heard expressed in by other people was fun bike rides like colorful lights like show the fun in biking get out the uh, one group has a Taco Tuesday ride, bike party, deck place making, culture making with bikes. Um, 
building a more successful experience um, to get cities behind those fun bike rides. So it's not just independent nonprofits and volunteers who are, are putting them out, but cities are promoting them so more people know about them and more people can go on them. Um, one idea was um, to do a haul a thon to show the utility of bikes by having people haul maybe ridiculous things on a variety of different kinds of bikes. Um, uh, like giant styrofoam sculptures or whatever. Um, another thought was uh, Caltrans has a program or did have a program when everyone was working remotely where if an employee uh, bicycles to work at least half the days in a month, they get a stipend for that. And so the idea was to maybe make that a state initiative so that that would go to employers all over the state, that the state could be involved in that. Um, employer credits for bike share. So employers could help people ride bikes to work by giving employees bike share credits. Um, another pop-up idea was a uh, quick build kind of thing was to turn class two bike lanes into pop-up class four bike lanes with just temporary uh, cones or bollards of some kind, maybe close the traffic lane so people can experience this is what it would be like if this crappy lane was a really great bike lane. Um, Another idea is to take cars off the street for a week in a particular spot, like no cars, not do, instead of just seek La Via, do it for a whole week and give that space over to biking and walking. Um, one thing that came up as a big um, problem for people, a big obstacle to biking is getting potholes fixed. It can be very slow with local governments. And so there was some discussion about um, renegade going out yourself and doing it. I know that happened actually in Oakland um, because Oakland has a huge pothole issue, but and apparently it's happened in New Orleans as well that private companies will come and fix potholes for you. So not waiting on the city. Um, another idea was crosswalk decorating contests to sort of rate, slow down cars and raise awareness or using chalk to create a mural on a street overnight. Um, and um, another thought was to make yourself available on social media as a commuter tutor so that individuals can reach out to the, um, to the interested but concerned population and say, I'm here, I'll help you. And that was it. Great, thank you so much everybody. This was super fun. Thank you, Julia, Florence, Jason, and Laura. And thank all of you. Really, really inspiring to hear all those ideas.